Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we do hope you're able to get out and get that garden ready for the season pretty soon. We would love to hear from you. If you've got a question, you can give us a call at 1-800-676-5446. You can also contact us via email with your questions and pictures for a future show, and that is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us where you live, give us as much information as you can so we can give you a good answer to that question. Do be sure to check out our YouTube channel. It has all of our programs and features from this year and some of the past seasons. Backyard Farmer is also on Facebook, so you can join and follow us during the week, so you have no excuses not to know what's going on. So, Kate, you've got a rather large sample. I do. <laughs> um, so it's a large sample for a tiny bug, but I get a lot of calls regarding um, gnats flying around in the house, and usually my first question for whoever calls is, do you have plants? So whether you have a lot of house plants in your home or you still have plants because you've been waiting to plant them in this crazy Nebraska weather, um, chances are you might come across these little fungus gnats. So these gnats are associated with the damp soil of plants. Um, and if you're like me and you buy plant pots that don't have good drainage, um, it can be an issue. So we can kind of see here on this yellow sticky trap, the really small little black gnats. Um, and controlling them is pretty fairly easy. For the adults, you can use a yellow sticky trap just like this one here. And then to control the larvae, the best thing you can do is just let your plant dry out between watering. Um, if it's really bad, you can also use um, a, like a BT-based insecticide that's targeted to gnats as well. Excellent, and they really are dinky. It's, and there's so many when they decide yes. they're happy. Yes. <laughs> all right, Terry, you're in the turf chair tonight. Yep, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> so um, my sample is, this is bed straw. Bed straw you can see right now, and it's gonna be lime green out usually in your landscape beds where you kind of have some thinning areas. It's very easy to pull. It's got a tiny, tiny little root on it. So it's really easy, there we go, to pull out. Um, the one thing about this is that it will stick to you. Um, at the, by the end of the night tonight, I will have rash all over me because I am allergic to it. It will have white flowers. The flowers turn into these tiny little um, seed balls and the seed balls will stick to critters and that's how it gets distributed um, all over the place. So this is bed straw, easy to pull, don't have to worry about any kind of chemical control. Just when you pull it, make sure that you are using gloves. And don't throw it at anyone. Don't throw it at anybody. All right. Dennis, what in the world? Well, <laughs> birds are trying to nest right now. Mm -hmm. And so if it's <clears throat> Once they build a nest and they put an egg there, if it's anything but a European starling, a house sparrow, or a pigeon, you can't touch it until they're done with that nest. That's the Migratory Bird Act of 1974. So if it's a robin or a swallow or a grackle, they build a nest and once they have it complete and an egg in there, you can't touch it. But that you can deter them from building a nest. And these are several devices that you can use. They're like porcupine wire. You put it where they want to start to build a nest. So if they start building a nest, you wipe that mud off or that grass and adhere this. And then they can't build. It's, it's kind of sharp. And this one's even sharper. And this one's great. If you have um, birds sitting on statues, you can put it right on it like this, and then the bird won't sit there and defecate. So sometimes when I'm walking around, there's a lot of pigeons, I just wear this, and then the <laughs> pigeons don't sit and defecate on me like usual. But um, <laughs> birds have a tendency to defecate on me. But there's several different types um, that you can purchase fairly easy. And this is one that's for our bigger birds because it's not as pointed. And if you have a long type of uh, Eve, where they can nest at any point, you can use this type. It's a bit more, it's plastic, it's a bit more uh, inexpensive, but it, these are all to stop birds from nesting. Again, get them up as soon as they start to build that nest, wipe off that material, and get something like this up there. 
And that stuff is available online mostly? I, yeah, I got all of it from online, but I'm sure you can get, a, there's usually one or two available at some of the box stores mm -hmm. um, and, and garden centers. Okay. I have a quick question for you, Terry. <laughs> What's it called when the bed straw sticks to something or a tick gets on something to move its <laughs> seed or juvenile? I have no idea. I don't want to know. Do you remember, Kate? You took my class. That was like a decade ago. 4C. 4C. It's called 4C. P-H-O-R-E-Y. Clearly, you were not a very good teacher in that class. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and on that note, Jim. And on that note, I'm out. <laughs> And I mean, you laugh about him wearing that. I mean, I see him on campus all the time with that on his head. So, I mean, it's not really a joke. People wonder what's going on. So, I have, um, I have a, a few things here. The, the purple leaf plant, I'll turn here, is a purple hazelnut. It's here for color, as is the, the viburnum, the fragrant viburnum flower. So, that was my wife's idea, because she didn't like the idea that it just had some green things with little tiny flowers. And so the idea behind this is that we get a lot of questions about things like blueberries or some of the other um, small fruits. And uh, especially if you have a hard time, if you've had a hard time, and a lot of people do with blueberries, they're tough to grow in this area. Currants, so there's a few, there's a white currant, red currant, and a black currant, um, all do very well in our climate. Uh, they do well in our soils. Um, they certainly would prefer a, a better, richer soil. If you have something with, a little, with more organic matter, they'll do a little bit better for you. But they really don't require a lot of care. They don't have pests. Um, they don't require a lot of supplemental irrigation. Certainly, if we're in a dry period, you might want to give it some extra water. But unlike a lot of other small fruits, they don't require a lot of attention. And they're very productive. Um, and so if that's something you want to do is grow some things to have some syrups or jams. Um, it's an easy plant. They're relatively inexpensive to get bare root. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they're kind of fun to have. And so. they're pretty. And we have yeah. some, we, we actually have some in the backyard farmer garden. Yeah. So very nice. All right. Thanks all, right. all. Okay, Kate, you get the very first round of picture questions. Um, your first one here is, <laughs> Eggs on asparagus, mm -hmm. and what? In, not very yummy. So yes. what, is, what is that and what does she do about it? So these are the eggs of the common asparagus beetle, which is a pest of asparagus, but they're pretty easy to see. So if you're seeing eggs on your asparagus, go ahead and squish those, remove them. But you're gonna need to kind of continue monitoring throughout the growing season. Um, the larvae and the adults are pretty easy to pick off, squish, put in soapy water. Um, but they complete their life cycle in just a month. So there's gonna be multiple generations throughout the season. So it's just important to kind of go out there, take a look, remove what you can. And then fall cleanup is also really important for these as well, um, because the adults will overwinter in the debris under stones. So in the fall, you know, kind of take a look if you plan on planting asparagus again next year. Oops, we use ours in the backyard <laughs> farmer garden all winter because it's so pretty. <laughs> well, all right, your next one is, uh, this is from Swedberg, and last year they had issues with watermelon. He wants to know, is this insect or disease? And you get it this week and Kath <laughs> might get it next week. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I consulted with our rots and spots experts because I wasn't confident this is insect related. Mm -hmm. But um, I think the consensus was it's called watermelon rind rot. Um, and it's interesting because we believe it's caused by a bacteria. We don't really know what bacteria causes it yet. And there's no external symptoms associated with it. So you don't know that it's an issue in the watermelon until you bust it open. Luckily, it's still edible. It's just not very good looking. <laughs> yeah, no, not going on my table. <laughs> okay, you have uh, you have two pictures here, and this is um, this is a tree that's been there 20 years. It's a pine, lots of space, and you see a little closer up, which I think does land on your plate. Yeah, yeah. so um, this is likely the Zimmerman pine moth. Mm -hmm. um, so the caterpillars are a pest of the trees. They burrow into that wood. And you can kind of see on the holes in this picture, it's got that popcorn-esque yellow pitch mass that comes out when the caterpillars tunnel in there. Um, so timing is really important when treating a tree for Zimmerman pine moth. We've, we're past the window for that first treatment in early April. So if you're able to treat, your next window is going to be early August. It's kind of easy to remember the A months, April, August. 
Um, but another issue is that you're going to have to treat the whole tree, which might be difficult given its age. Mm -hmm. um, but you need to treat it with something like um, permethrin, bifenthrin, labeled for, for the Zimmerman pine moth, and you have to spray it until it's pretty much run off from the tree. All right. Thanks, Kate. Okay, Terry, your first two pictures are West Omaha, uh, kind of beyond Boys Town, shows this weedy grass coming up in the yard, spreading into planting beds. Can you tell what it is and how to get rid of it? <clears throat> so it's really hard to sometimes to tell from grasses on pictures because you actually have to like get in there and see them. But I think this is just a tall fescue, like one of the kind of not nice pretty ones that we want in turf. Um, what you need to do is look at it, it won't have a midrib and it'll have kind of like these lines, like really distinct lines, venations on it. So that will be a good sign. I, when I blew up, I could, it pixelated and I couldn't see it very well, but that's what I think it is. Um, you can hand pull it out. Um, you can continue mowing, um, just kind of keeping it down if you don't care what it looks like. Um, or you can use, um, a call for call for call zone on it and um, spray it and I'll probably take a couple sprays. All right. Thanks, Terry. You have two on this next one also. And this is Beatrice areas in the yard that have clumps of this broadleaf grass that looks like weeds. What is this and how do I control it? So I think this one is downy brome. Um, it, that's what I'm thinking. It's kind of a little like a bunch grass. It usually comes up pretty early this time of year. Um, this one actually would be easier to get out than the tall fescue. So you can just go out with your soil knife and dig it out um, to get rid of it. Don't let it go to seed because once it goes to seed, you'll have 10,000 of them all over the place. Um, making sure that you have a good stand of turf to kind of help stuff that off is, is important. Um, and if you want to spray for it, um, tenacity would be the thing that you could use for that. All right, thanks, Terry. Okay, Dennis, critter time. Good. Your first one here is from Council Bluffs. Uh, this is property abutting a pasture, had a handful of these holes, had dozens put out pellets thinking he was dealing with voles and poison thinking he was dealing with rats. And what? What do we think this is? Well, first, you need to identify before you put any toxicants out. It's very, very important that you do that because um, certain toxins only work for certain things and certain toxins can be a big problem. So in, the general rule is identify first, then worry about control. OK, so you don't blindly try to control anything. With that said, that does look like something digging for something. It, it's hard to see how deep the hole goes. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like voles, but then the long, the part that's kind of long and pushed, it could be something like a opossum or a skunk digging for grubs or earthworms. Um, probably not grubs this time of year, probably earthworms. That's what I'm going for. All right, so your next two pictures are mysterious holes. <laughs> <laughs> in patches six to eight feet across, this is a dormant alfalfa field, two to four inches in diameter, no sign of activity, their dog doesn't bother. And this is Mondaman, Iowa. Yeah, so I'm, I was trying to look at it, and it almost looks like something going after something, maybe even a big bird going after. So I'm trying to see what, if that's just a mat of old stand of alfalfa? It's old, yeah, he said it's dormant alfalfa. Yeah, so underneath there, there could be mice mm. um, or voles, and what you have is birds of prey diving in after them, and so they hear them underneath there, and then they go down and they get them and pull them out. I'd love to see that. Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> And you have one more, and this is holes in a backyard lawn. <laughs> This is Bellevue, not really sure on what's going on this one. I think there's one more. Yep. This is definitely voles yep. because of the trailing and the fact that the hole has, you can see where it can go in. So this is voles with a V, mm -hmm. which are, are granivore. However, it is better and usually, usually more efficient to use the multi-catch traps. Mm -hmm. And they hold up to 15 at a time. They're nocturnal. Put the trap next to the run. Put a little bird seed or grass seed around the entrance. You don't have to put anything in the trap. You wind it up and it'll hold up to 15. And usually you can get four or five in one night. 
And you have one more picture, and this is Norfolk, okay. and uh, they're wondering what that is. Same thing, it's a vole. <laughs> ditto, 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 the box uh, repeating trap. All right, we had lots of holes yeah. to send in this Well, year. the thing is, this is from the winter, yeah. and you're seeing it now. They do this in the summer, but the grass is actually growing, and you don't see their paths. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right, um, you have a series of sad questions, I'm afraid, tonight, okay. too. It's not that okay. nature hasn't been nice to us. This is Papillion, uh, Arborvita. This is planted early last spring, thrived until he did surround it with burlap over the winter, watered it, but it's turned almost this dry gray. Any hope, or is this a... You know, I would, um, with this particular tree, I would, um, I think I'd wait a little bit. Uh, you could go ahead and prune off the stuff that seems clearly dead, and sometimes I'll just run my hands over it and if the, the needles come off. Um, we had some good luck with some arborvitae on campus that actually had bagworms pretty bad that I cleaned up, mm -hmm. and they did not look great, um, but they've recovered pretty well from it, So and it took some time. So if you're patient, I think in that the other thing I would do in that particular case is, is also pull back the rock and mm -hmm. let's mulch an area at least a foot or two away from the base of the tree mm -hmm. uh, to give it a chance. So. All right. Your next two are Blair. Okay. Um, there's a Hetz Midget, which is partly green. These are Arborvita also. And there's a Golden Globe that is really brittle all over. Can they come out of this? That particular one is a replace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I think so. that's the Golden Globe. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Hetz Midget, I think, was like half and half, maybe. And that one there. And mm -hmm. that would be one that I would be, again, I would be tempted to go in, depending on how the plant is in your landscape, how important it is. If it's something that you feel is really important, and then I would replace it. Or, again, you can prune out the dead and give it a chance and see if it recovers. But it will take a while. So. All right. And you have two pictures here, I think, from Omaha, or maybe one. And this is Holly. Um, two pictures on this one. They watered the plants during the warmer days. They've had it about 10 years. It's never looked like this. Should they take the root, just the dead branches out or the whole thing? Uh, with the holly, many times you'll see the canes will start to turn black, or much like a rose, you'll kind of see a distinction between the live mm -hmm. and the dead. Um, so I would. You could look at that, and again, you could take out all the canes that are clearly dead, um, and some of them that are green that may have dead leaves on them, they, they will likely come back from it. So hollies are pretty tough, so it may take some, you know, it could take a severe pruning and still recover from it. All right, great, thanks. Well, you know, we've covered the topic of hydrangeas several times over the past few seasons. Right now is the time to get your pruning shears out and make a few strategic cuts. Know what species you have and how it grows before you take out those pruning shears. So let's take a minute to see how it's done. We got so many questions about pruning hydrangeas, we thought we'd actually show you how to do it with some of the different types that we grow here. This is panicle hydrangea. It is one of the ones that is easiest to prune. It's late flowering. You can see it has begun to break its buds. And so we're a little on the edge, but we can still prune this one hard. And the beauty of this one is depending on how low you want it to go, you can really take a lot of, of the stems off of this one. You can see the old flower heads. Obviously, we'll be taking those off, but I'll show you exactly why we make the pruning cuts where we do because one of the cool things about these panicle hydrangeas, whether it's the big one or one of the smaller ones, is if you look, you'll see a location where there are actually three buds. And if all three of those buds break, you will actually have the potential for three flower heads later in the summer. The beauty of the panicle hydrangeas is they are 100% woody, which means they're not gonna die back in the winter months. And that really also sort of informs how we're going to prune them. The dwarf ones, like this little quick fire, have been bred for smaller stature, slightly different kind of flower form, but how we're going to prune this is going to be really relatively similar to the way we prune the big one. We're going to look for those buds, we're going to prune back as far as we want, but we're not really trying to reduce the height on this one. This is one of the big leaf hydrangeas, and people are probably familiar with Endless Summer, 
and all of the spin-offs or the knockoffs. Here's the issue. Those were actually bred to bloom on both old wood and new wood, but typically in our zone, the old wood is not hardy. So you have to really wait on these to see where those new buds break. And then what I'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and prune off everything that appears as though it did not make it through the winter, which may mean not flowers until very late. We'll identify a place where it looks like we're going to have a good shoot. And again, you may not get good flowering out, out of these macrophylla uh, hydrangeas. And that is particularly true if you prune off everything, either in the fall or in the spring. Oak leaf hydrangea is also one of the ones that is 100% woody. It's also one that typically needs very little pruning with the exception of removing the dead wood. And this is a winter where we got a fair amount of dead wood. The peeling bark will not need to be pruned off as long as you still have live buds. However, this hydrangea will bloom on old wood. And so what that really means is you're going to do the pruning after flowering occurs, if you need to do any shaping whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is just take out some of the dead wood, leave all this new growth alone. We'll see what has to be pruned out after it flowers a little bit later. A fourth hydrangea is the smooth hydrangea known as Annabelle. Easy to prune because this is one that you take either all the way down or you take it down about 18 inches. So again, we've talked about four different types of hydrangeas that have essentially four different types of pruning. Make sure you know which one you have before you sharpen those pruning shears. Do make sure you do know what type of hydrangea you have before you start or you're going to take off those flower buds. Also be on the lookout for those damaged or crossing stems. You can prune those out just about any old time. All right, Kate, uh, this is Blair. Recently opened the window and found this debris. Did it come from an insect or just is this mousy? I think I need to pass this question to Dennis. This looks mousy to me. Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> That was probably closed for a while, mm -hmm. and some rodent was nesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very and much so. I, I think I don't know whether she's so be real more quickly. Out by that. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't already taken care of it, do not sweep it or vacuum it. Use water. Use something wet and pick it up and get rid of it because if you vacuum, the diseases and the defecation will become airborne. You may breathe them in. So never vacuum anything like that. All right, thanks, Dennis and Kate. <laughs> Kate, this one is, she keeps finding these bugs in her house. Is it a good bug or a bad bug? Thank you. So this is, depending on the situation, a bad bug. This is a larder beetle. Um, they're one of the pantry pests. They like to eat dried goods, um, stored products, including cured meat, thus the name larder beetle. So when dealing with pantry pests, it's really important to find the source of the infestation. So could it be an item in your pantry, go through boxes of you know, flour, whatever could be in there. I've seen them in bags of dog food quite frequently. Um, so try to find the source of the infestation. If it's important, you can freeze it, but otherwise you can just pitch it. All right, thanks, Kate. Terry, um, your first one here is a Prosser, Nebraska viewer. What is this large green plant and what to do about it? Hmm, that is curly dock. Mm -hmm. And just go get your shovel and dig it. It's going to have a very big root, so make sure you get most of it. Um, otherwise, it's going to come back up. All right. Your second two are from Llewellyn. How did they get rid of this weed? Used glyphosate or Roundup last year, killed both the grass and the weed. Now it's coming into the bare spots. I think you have two different weeds here. The first one I think is a mallow. Um, so depending on which one it is, it could be a perennial. So you may need to reapply that glyphosate on more than one occasion to get that. And then this one, the second one is henbit. So that one actually germinated last fall. So if you need to actually control it in the fall, Mm -hmm. And then it, once it warmed up, which we didn't really ever get cold, but once it warmed up, it started going. Make sure that you keep the, the flowers off of it because it's going to have hundreds of seeds and then you're going to have an even bigger problem next fall, next spring. So you can actually put a pre-emergent down in the fall to stop it from germinating in the spring. And plant decent grass. Yes, you need to improve <laughs> your grass. All right, you have one more and... 
This is an Omaha viewer. It could be from a lot of people. Had a tree stump ground down last year. This is what's left. Wants to grow grass right on top of it. Can he just throw grass seed on top or does he need to dig, add topsoil, then seed? So it looked like you had, it was, looks like you've leveled it off pretty well from what I could tell in the picture. The one thing that you're gonna have a problem with is that all of that wood is gonna be competing for the nutrients in, um, and kind of stop the, the seed growth if you plant new seed in there. So you're probably gonna have to put a little bit of extra fertilizer in there. Um, you can put the seed down. I would put some kind of something over there to keep it moist. Um, it may, I would do it now, and then you may have to baby it through the summer and then do it again in the fall. All right, thanks, Terry. Dennis, not holes yet. <laughs> this is uh, south of Hickman. It's a silver maple with this damage. Is this a squirrel or something else? Should you it cut it off or leave it? It's definitely a squirrel, mm -hmm. and it looks like it went all the way around, so that's more of a horticultural question, but what I've learned from our horticulturists, cut it off. Mm -hmm. And usually squirrels will not do this to native trees, because they live with native trees, but things like elms and silver maples, they get sugar from that and starch, mm -hmm. and so they do that for nutritional value in the winter. All right. You have two pictures for this one, um, and this is in Omaha, small lilac at the far corner of the backyard. Was doing great, about three weeks later, something did this, they haven't seen any tracks. They have seen deer tracks in the fall, but not lately. So it's high up, more than five feet. Yeah. What do you think here? Well, it could possibly be a squirrel, but the way it looks more look up and down, I'm going deer, mm -hmm. rubbing it, especially if it happened you know, mm -hmm. if in the fall, over the winter, um, especially in the fall, but mm -hmm. it could also happen in the spring. They do it just as, actually more, so I say deer. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so your next one is, it's a fun question. Why won't my grass grow? This is on the Calamus <laughs> River in Brown County. <laughs> he sent three pictures of this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why the grass is not growing. Um, uh, why the turkeys there? <laughs> yeah, he thinks it's turkeys, I think, that are uh, stomping, picking, and eating. Yeah, and <laughs> but I mean, I've seen tons of turkeys in places where there's good grass, so. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> if it's good, hardy grass, the turkeys aren't going to change it. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, your first one, Jeff, is... Um, what killed these junipers or is killing them and what should they replant? This is Council Bluffs and it's five of them. They were planted by a garden center and then noticed some discoloration last year on the two outside ones, chopped it off. And then the outside of the next pair has started to deteriorate. So inside <laughs> turned into corpses over a week. So hmm. any idea on this one other than size at planting or? Yeah, it could be a, a variety of things. I think certainly uh, it wouldn't hurt to send a sample into the plant path lab for them mm. to take a look at mm. to see if there is a disease. Um, you could get in there and look and see if there's a canker on some of the branches. That would be another thing to look for to okay. see if there's anything like that. My guess is it may be a root desiccation sort of issue. So. All right, you have two pictures on this one, which is Bennett, cedar is losing leaves. Kind of maybe the same thing. I think so too, yeah. So I think probably roots, uh, roots not developing and with the desiccation this year, it was probably too much. Okay, and your next one is mother load, creeping juniper in Central City, 75 to 80% looking like this. Yeah. Is this a goner? Uh, you know, it's a big plant. I would be tempted to give it a little bit of time and see if it comes out of it, but I would suspect you're replacing goner. it. All right. We haven't gotten much planted yet out at our garden. This past week, we got some heavy equipment out to do some digging. There's some wonderful early season flowers going on right now, so let's hear from Terry about what is going on in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're doing a little bit of construction. Our production bed erodes a lot when the rain comes and we lose a lot of soil off that bed. So we're putting a small retaining wall in to kind of help hold that soil in. 
and to make that production bed much more efficient. But we have some wonderful things blooming in the backyard farmer garden right now. We have our curry and spice viburnums going. We have our red and white tulips. We have all of our pansies still up and going and looking fantastic. We're looking forward to moving our plants out of the greenhouse to start hardening them off. And the plants that we've planted in our raised bed, those cool season plants, the peas, the lettuces, the radishes, are all up and growing and looking fantastic. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now it is time for lightning. Jeff, ready? Nope. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> All right, this is a Fremont viewer who has a hemlock and she killed an elderberry, but now it is shooting all over the place underneath it. How does she kill the shoots without killing the hemlock? Uh, dig up the elderberry. Okay, all those shoots. All those shoots. Hickman, uh, what is the best mulch for a garden without introducing more weeds? Well, you can get clean wood mulch. Mm -hmm. So I think probably any place you get it from a, either a bagged stuff or some of our local suppliers, I, you would, I would trust that not having weed seeds in it. All right. A North Bend viewer wants to know if the weather is still too cold to plant wildflowers. No, it's not too cold. All right. This is a viewer who wants to know when and how much to prune back a 15-foot tall burning bush. Uh, you could do some of the pruning now. You're going to want to take it in stages. So I think I would take some back now, maybe a foot or so, depending on what it is. Look at some of the canes, uh, but it's a process. That would be a multi-year process. All right. We have a viewer who wants to know whether it's too late to plant spinach and lettuce. No, it's not too late. All right. Nice job. Yeah, great job. <clears throat> okay. You ready, Dennis? I am ready. All right. <laughs> This is a Gretna viewer who wants to know how you can discourage doves or pigeons from roosting on their roof. Use what I showed in the beginning of the show. <laughs> on your head. We have, we have a viewer here who has a 3,000 gallon koi pond and had leopard frogs in it. 10 of the 25 died off. He wants to know how to stop the rest from dying off. Get rid of the koi. They're adding too much nitrogen. All right. Uh, Omaha viewer wants to know how to get rid of moles. Mold? Moles. 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 Use the gummy worms. All right. This is a viewer in Lincoln who has a koi pond, has a beautiful great blue heron he loves to watch, but it eats all his koi. How can he discourage the great blue heron? Use native fish instead of those Chinese orange colored things. Okay, this is a York viewer who says she has a critter hole big enough for a cat to go down into. What would that be maybe? Woodchuck. Woodchuck, all right. Nice job. Good job. <clears throat> Woodchuck. Chuck. Chucks. Could Woodchuck. chuck a wood. Groundhog, ground, same thing. <laughs> Whistle pig. Yeah. All right, Terry, are you ready? Yep. Several questions from viewers about how to control violets in the lawn because they are now violeting. Oh, those are so pretty. Why, why control them? Uh, you control them in the fall with um, a three-way broadleaf weed killer. All right. Um, we have a viewer who really wants to get rid of dandelions but is wondering whether weed and feed will do it and should they put it down in drought? Um, no, but you know what? It's really good just to go out there with an adult beverage and your soil knife and just start working on it every night. And your third question is somebody wants to know how deep do you have to dig to do that? Uh, you have to go down pretty far. Well, it depends on how old they are, but you'll have to go down pretty far and make sure that you get most of the root. If you get most three-fourths of it, you should be pretty good. All right, uh, this viewer wants to put down a slip and slide and they've been told to use dish soap, soap on it to make it slippery. Will that hurt the lawn? Uh, probably not if you kind of rinse it off all when you're done. <laughs> okay, nice job for she who's not really the turf <laughs> lightning person. <laughs> all right, Kate, you ready? Yes. Okay, this is a Plattsmouth viewer who wants to know how to control clover mites in the lawn. Um, so in the lawn, it's gonna be hard to do, but you can prevent them coming inside by doing a perimeter treatment. All right, with what? With a pyrethroid-based insecticide. All right, this is a Grand Island viewer who uh, wants to know 
is there a systemic for Japanese beetles that she can use on her elderberry and she does want to eat the elderberries? Um, usually with Japanese beetles, um, I'm not sure about systemic, probably not. Um, best thing you can do is just hand pick them off. All right. Um, this viewer has said they've now seen those white and yellow butterflies flying around already. Should they be protecting their broccoli and so forth from those butterflies? Um, yeah, if they're not flowering, you can do like row covers or something, but otherwise their eggs are easy to spot, so you can just scout for them. All right. You already mentioned that the um, um, Zimmerman window is closed, yes. so with our temperature being so strange, do you expect it to be different in August, or don't you know? I, I don't know. That's a good question. We'll see, won't we? Yeah. All right. Three-way tie. Nice. Shoot. <laughs> okay, Jeff, what do we have for Plants of the Week? Well, you brought in a couple uh, things that are native to the eastern part of our country. Mm -hmm. So the first is a tree that's in flower right here, which is sassafras. And it's a fun tree. I remember being down by like the Ozarks. It grows native, natively mm -hmm. down there. It has kind of a mitten sort of leaf to it, I think of. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a fun tree. It's not a real large tree, um, but it does well kind of in an understory situation. Mm -hmm. So it's unusual. Um, and then our other plant is a Virginia bluebells. So again, another Eastern US native. Um, and you know, and they both kind of have a tendency to spread over time. Mm -hmm. But this will do its thing right now and then kind of fade away as things warm up. Exactly. Yeah. So, so very beautiful. Fun. Yeah, right very now. fun. All right, Kate, you have uh, three pictures here, and this is a tangelo tree in a germ in the ger geothermal greenhouse. Three years old, uh, so it's now eight years old. It's the first time it's flowered, and they found this invasions, and they think the ants are farming the aphids. They want to use organic control. Beautiful pictures. Mm -hmm. Yes, so these are aphids. Um, a greenhouse, especially for organic, you could always do you know, biological control, lady beetle larvae, um, green lacewing larvae, and then there's also some fungi that specifically attack aphids too that are available. All right, excellent. Um, then you have one that is from Petersburg, which is a Mexican petunia. Brought it in over the winter, it started to develop the bumps. She did say she can scratch them off. Yes. <laughs> so these are another one of those piercing sucking insects. These are called wax scales. Um, so scales are hard to control. You need to kind of wait for the crawlers before you can do like a horticultural oil. Otherwise, you know, start scratching, get off as much as you can. All right, thank you, Kate. Terry, uh, this, your first one here is uh, in Kearney, and this viewer wants to know how to deal with the ruts in their lawn. He did change his mowing <laughs> pattern. <laughs> so I just, I have a lot more questions before I can really answer this, but I couldn't tell, like, are you driving back and forth over this? Is this from mm -hmm. your lawnmower? Do you, I mean, is this a driveway to get to like a shed or something? I couldn't tell, but um, one, stop doing it. Um, two, <laughs> don't do it when it's wet. Um, I would start aerating it. I would aerate it probably twice a year for the next couple times to try to help pull some of that up. Um, and that's what I would start doing. <laughs> All right. Your next one is Bellevue, and uh, they're asking for the neighbor across the street, really. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know where to start renewing this front yard. So I think we have two pictures, the far away and the close up. <laughs> this... Yeah, this one is going to be a, probably a several year thing. So um, it looks like um, they have a lot of winter death. So if this was cool season grasses, they're probably going to have to do some aerating. I would do, definitely do aerating both in the spring and the fall for this one. You're probably going to have to be putting some fertilizer down. You might actually want to put some good... Um, Organic matter down, you're going to need to reseed, and you're most likely going to have to use some kind of something. Again, you can use that soil knife to go out and get those dandelions. That's a good afternoon calm down thing when you get from work to do and get all those out before you have success. All right, thanks. All right, um, back to holes, Dennis. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is Minden. Uh, three pictures here. Something's digging. She has seen raccoons and skunks during the night. The holes are one to three inches wide and one to six inches deep. 
and how does she stop them? So I think you have one here that also shows kind of the edge of the sidewalk for the... Yeah, it looks more like voles than anything else. Mm -hmm. It also could be 13 lane ground squirrels, but they wouldn't have that edge. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this one looks like a little bit of dirt, but when there's no dirt at all and there's no trail, then it's 13 line ground squirrels. All right, and how does she stop them from doing that? But, um, our neb guide has a great cage you can build to get rid of them, so All go, right. go to her. Excellent. Wildlife.unl.edu. Perfect. <laughs> Makes it easier. All right. You have um, two pictures for this one. So this is under her bird feeder in Fremont. She's wondering what came to visit during the night. Was he looking for roots, grubs, insects, or what? Yeah, it looks like skunk tracks more than anything else, but it could also be yeah, it's hard to tell if it's, skunks would love to go after that grain, so are raccoons, and so okay. they're just going after a spilled grain. So either stop feeding the birds or live yeah, with the skunks or, and raccoons. Or, right, or, right, or enjoy them, I don't know, whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, Jeff, uh, this is a Malcolm viewer, and uh, they're on an acreage, so they have a border of lilacs, 36 of them, and aside from deer damage, they're just Sticks. He wants them to prune them down to a foot, or should he do something else, like manage the site around them? Yeah, I think at this stage, um, we need to get the, the grass away from them. Again, we need to get things back a couple feet, um, mulch them, give them steady water, and then I would cage them. Mm -hmm. So I would have something at least three foot tall around all of them, mm -hmm. uh, and pin it down so that um, Dennis's animals don't tear the cage off of the top of them. So, um, <laughs> so, and that that'll give them half a chance. And then they'll start branching and do the other the other things. So then they'll have their lilacs. All right, thank you. Your next picture is a Douglas County viewer, also lilacs, uh, planted in a raised planter. Uh, and her question is whether she could plant butterfly weed. So one of the um, butterfly sure. things around it, or would it take over and kill the lilacs, or will the lilacs kill the butterfly weed? Uh, I think y if you can plant anything you want. I mean, keep things a foot or two away from the base of the plants just so you're not getting into the root systems, but it's a nice sunny spot, so you have a ton of choices. Uh, so go to the garden center and, and buy, buy to your heart's delight. So. <laughs> right. And you have one final one. This is Fairberry, a uh, new septic system. They're wondering at, uh, what could be planted over the drain field, and they want to avoid that wasteland of weeds. Sure. I think, you know, the simplest thing would be something like tall fescue. Um, in fact, when Terry was talking about some of the, the coarser forage sort of fescues, mm -hmm. you could certainly put something like that in there, and it would take over and do really well. Mm -hmm. You could do wildflowers. You could do any kind of variety of things in there. You want to stay away from trees and shrubs anything with a more vigorous root system, but I think, you know, again, use your imagination, you can make it fun. All right, excellent. Well, having some raised beds around your regular vegetable garden is a good way to grow those smaller vegetables, herbs, and save water, and you're back. If you're setting up some new raised beds for the season, you'll want to watch this second feature. Be prepared to do a little math. Last few years on the Backyard Farmer Garden, we have talked about raised beds and the benefits of the raised beds. We've given you some ideas of design, why they're important, and how they will help you succeed. But we haven't really talked about what you put inside that raised bed, and we've had a lot of questions about that. So we're going to show you really how to take your raised bed and kind of fill it up and what to do. But first, you have to do a little bit of garden math. The garden math involves making sure that you know the dimensions. So you have to know the length and the width and the height. And make sure you use all the same dimensions. A lot of times we'll measure this height in inches and we'll measure the length and the width in feet. But make sure that you keep them all in feet. So you may have to do a little bit of conversion when you do that. This bed is 4 by 8 by 32 inches, which turns out to be 2.6 feet. So you take that multiply all three of those numbers together and you get 83 cubic feet. Now often you're going to go to a landscape company most likely to get order bulk if you're going to get that much soil. You can get it by bags, but 
I suggest getting it by bulk and have it delivered because it's going to be a lot easier. So most landscape companies are going to ask for it in yards. So you're going to take that 83 cubic feet, divide that by 27, and you're going to have your total yards. This one will be a little over three yards to fill completely. Don't forget, over the season, it will compact down a little bit. But don't worry, you're going to continually add it. And most likely, you're going to be making your compost. So that's what you'll be able to add back into that soil to kind of keep refreshing it throughout the season. Oftentimes, if you have multiple of these big beds, you'll actually may want to think about kind of filling that bottom. And that's where we're going to come in and kind of figure that out a little bit more. You can actually put cardboard on the bottom. That's really going to help decompose it. And that will help stop some of those weeds from coming up, especially that nasty bindweed. You can also add some of your logs. You can add some branches. You can add some food scraps for composting. You can also add some of your own compost. So if you figure that out, make sure that you subtract that distance of the height if you don't want to order as much soil. So lots of opportunities for raised beds. We've looked at design over the years and we looked at, at how successful they are. And now we're looking at how to fill them up. So try raised beds. They're a fantastic way to help you succeed and do well in your backyard for growing all of your produce. You know, much like the way you fill up the bottom of any large container to save weight in potting soil, that technique will help you save money on soil and compost in your larger raised beds. We have many features on the benefits of raised beds and plenty of other topics on our YouTube channel. You can also watch those past shows from this and other seasons. Take a few minutes to check it out after the show. Hit subscribe. All right, Kate. This is uh, Aspen in Scotts Bluff Gearing. It's had leaf spot, not much else, but there is a monster kind of interesting hole in the trunk on this one. So what do we think? And there's also holes higher up in the tree. Yeah, so it could be the poplar borer beetle. Um, most important thing to do about that, you could treat it, but just keep the tree healthy, watered, mulch, you know, All those no things. mowing damage, yeah. All those things. Yes. All right, uh, you have two pictures on this one, and this is bruning. What could these holes be along the east side of the house? Yeah, I love these. So these are little antlion pits. So there is the larva of an antlion at the very bottom of each of those pits, just waiting for ants to walk by so they can have a nice meal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that thing on Star Wars. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pulls things down. <laughs> All right, Terry, this is a Paxton viewer. Um, what kind of grass is this in the iris bed? And is there any kind of spray that will kill the grass, but not the iris? Um, I think this is just like a bluegrass or whatever you have. Um, you can hand pull this out if you want. Um, you can also use um, some like... Uh, <laughs> Lost your train of thought. I did lose my train of thought. Yeah. Um, hand pull it out or you can remove your, the iris in July or August and then get rid of all the weeds and then plant them back. All right. And now you have weed control in my iris. <laughs> this is a different weed, so this is a broadleaf. Yeah. Um, so this, I think, is chickweed. Um, that's actually very easy to pull, so I would just go pull that one out. All right. Uh, your third picture here is a rural giltner. How do you get those chives out of a lawn? So do not let it go to seed. Do not let it flower go to seed because you're gonna have even more and it's going to reproduce both by those seeds and by their bulbs. So if you can go out again with your drink of choice and your soil knife, you can start digging those bulbs out and get rid of them. Um, if you don't wanna do that, I would mow them off and then use like 2,4-D to spray on that to get rid of them. All right, Dennis. Um, yes. This is a picture from an Omaha viewer. She wonders what kind of a bird would have fur in their feces. The only bird, I don't know if that's bird, but the only bird that would have fur in the feces would be a hawk or bird of prey. Mm -hmm. uh, most of that, most of them will spit it out with the small bones like owls. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if that's a pellet. I would have to see it closer or a feces. It may be a pellet which they spit out. 
Okay. But any bird of prey or owl would have fur in it. All right. Uh, and then we have a Tecumseh, Nebraska question. And have to wait this long to get a decent <laughs> picture. <laughs> and, and they actually said, we thought this would make a really good segment or question for Dennis. Yeah, it's please, a black rat snake. Well, and please assure him the snake was not harmed. Good. There was a, re a robin's nest apparently in the eaves that right. they think he was trying to. Yes, no. definitely. <laughs> <laughs> this is our only semi-arboreal snake in Nebraska. It lives near the Missouri River in oak savannas, um, and it eats birds and bird eggs, because um, birds, this reptile's gone bad and the whole scheme of things. <laughs> and so it was just climbing up, and, um, and great. And they can climb up a sycamore tree. It's amazing what they can do. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Amazing snakes. <laughs> okay, and then your next one is um, a, a bat, a little bat picture, and this is a bat that these people found on the ground, and they put it in a flower pot, and it hung out there. Is that like a sick bat or a little bat or what? No, it's, it looks like a bat? red bat, and I don't know. I wouldn't say it's sick. Um, it's a little early for them to have their, the red bats are the last one to have their young in June. They have twins, so sometimes when they get ready to give birth, they fall to the ground and have a hard time getting up. Mm -hmm. But it's too early for that, so I'm not sure. I would just leave it be, try to stay away from it, and mm -hmm. see what happens. All right. All right, uh, Jeff, this is an Ord, Nebraska viewer that has a globe blue spruce. Uh, two pictures here, they wanna know if they can prune some of the bottom up because they wanna see a little bit more trunk, but they don't want to hurt the plant. Yeah, well, I think with any kind of pruning, you know, a simple trick is to pick the branch and, and pull it down, pull it off to the side, have someone else look at it and see what kind of hole you're going to leave. Mm -hmm. So because, you know, again, once you prune it, you can't put it back on. So <laughs> on the other bit of advice is, you know, start on, start from the outside and work your way in. So mm -hmm. start small and work in until you feel like you've taken enough off. So. All right, and your next uh, question is a Columbus viewer. Um, he says he typically leaves one to two feet of stem when pruning back this rose in the fall. He's wondering, should he prune shorter than that or not? Well, in this particular case, there's a lot of dead in this rose, so you need to remove all the dead. All right. Start with that. Okay, yeah. thanks. Well, we have a lot of announcements tonight of fun things going on in the gardening world, and we hope you can take advantage of those. Our first one is Spring Affair Plant Sale, which is the 29th and 30th at the Lancaster County Event Center. It's uh, live this time, and we have a thing on the, on the screen for you on that one. Our second one is the Holy Trinity Arts Festival. It will be May 14th from 10 to 5-ish. Church of the Holy Trinity on A Street. That should be really fun uh, to see all the vendors and, and displays. Third one is the UNL Horticulture Club Spring Plant Sale, May 4th and 5th from 9 to 4. The 6th, probably 10 to 1. Teaching Greenhouse West, which is on East Campus. That's always a great thing as well. And then, of course, we have Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook. And there, there is a new segment coming next Thursday. We have all sorts of great segments coming up. You can also follow us on Backyard Farmer and Nebraska Public Media for that. So that will be uh, fun. And I think it's on raised beds. We have one more question, Kate. This is going to go to you because this came and we have like 20 seconds. Great. Cloverleaf mites inside the glass of a building. They've been using malathion on it, uh, south side mainly, and they've had an exterminator and they're in Superior and it's not working. <laughs> yeah, clover mites are tricky, but they don't reproduce inside, vacuum them up inside, and they're seasonal and temporary. So you kind of have to live with them for a little bit. Patience. Yes. All right.